the phrase square the circle refers to the premise that states for any square with finite given area a circle with identical area may be constructed and vice versa such that for every finite circle with a fixed area a square with the identical area could be arranged it is mathematically impossible to exactly square any circle that is to construct a square and circle with precisely identical areas in fact it is impossible to such an extent the phrase square the circle itself has become a polemic for attempting to attain the unobtainable the mathematical impossibility of squaring the circle was proved in 1882 A.D. when Ferdinand von Lindemann realized the transcendental nature of the by then already accepted as irrational number sum called by the Greek letter pi. The significance to squaring the circle of this transcendental number sum called pi derives from the origin of the concept for pi being the ratio of a circle's circumference and hence its area to its diameter and radius and hence to its radius squared the universal formula for thus determining the area of any circle volume for any sphere etc was discovered by Archimedes 287 until 212 BC and states the area of any circle equals pi multiplied by the circle's radius squared or that is the radius sum multiplied by itself doubled exponentially etc this was the earliest proposition for the variable called pi that was later proved to be an irrational and transcendental number sum as well. Archimedes established pi as between 3 and a seventh and 3 and 10 out of 71, or more exactly, using regular 96 gons, between the sharp inequalities 223 divided by 72 and 22 over 7. The earliest now known of reference to the concept expressed by Archimedes as the Greek letter pi comes from the around 1600 BC copy from an ancient Egyptian Middle Kingdom text now called the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus, where the number sum was approximated as 256 over 81, or roughly 3.16. The first now known of person to have attempted to apply the formula for finding a circle's area from its radius squared to the problem of squaring the circle was Anaxagoras of Athens 510 until 428 BC while mathematicians ever since have struggled to prove the impossibility of squaring the circle until finally succeeding in 1882 with the discovery of the transcendental nature of pi Less exact approximations have been made by numerologists and number theorists studying sacred geometry patterns. In ancient reckoning, squaring the circle was not considered mathematically impossible due to the technicality of the area of a circle being dependent on a transcendental variable and was, instead, practiced as a commonplace fact by simple estimation such manners may seem crude 
but they got the great pyramids of the Giza Necropolis built. Throughout his 13-book mathematical treatise of around 300 B.C., called simply The Elements, Greek mathematician Euclid of Alexandria likely borrows a great deal from earlier, probably primarily Pythagorean polymaths, although Pythagoras, 570 till 495 BC, is himself cited as the source for only two axioms, recalled to this day as Book 1, Propositions 47 and 48. The postulate premised in these propositions is taught to this day as one of the earliest and most integral discoveries of a universally generalizable mathematical axiom in human history. The fact that Pythagoras studied trigonometry so much that he discovered a rule that applies to all right-angled triangles was, at that time, presumably unprecedented. This rule, called still the Pythagorean Theorem, describes the fact that, in a right-angled triangle, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the sides. Prior to Pythagoras, similar generalizable observations had been posited in the Chinese Zhu Bi Zhuangjing from sometime between 1046 and 771 BC. However, nowadays Pythagoras remains credited in the history of Western civilization with first recognizing the universality of applicability for this general observation. What makes the universal generalizability of this arguably earliest mathematical axiom appear additionally miraculous is the fact that in almost all cases, aside from those called the Pythagorean triples, the measures of the sines of such triangles are not whole number sums, but inequalities, with remainders of decimals or fractions. The particular example of a Pythagorean triple, given by Euclid, is nowadays the most well-known format for such. A triangle with two legs, one length three units, the other length four around a right angle, opposite which is a hypotenuse of length 5, connecting to the 3 unit length leg at an around 54 degree angle and to the 4 unit length leg at a roughly 36 degree angle. The closest approximations of these exact angles are 36.87 degrees and 53.13 degrees. This example of a Pythagorean triple right triangle is also the sole triangle with edge lengths that proceed in arithmetic progression, making it a special case of right triangle as well. Like all Pythagorean triples, the right triangle of lengths 3, 4, and 5, is also Huronian, named for Hero of Alexandria, whom lived from 10 until 70 A.D. It thus has a total area that may be expressed in whole integer number sums as well. The so-called 3 to 4 to 5 Ratio Pythagorean triple, or simply the 3 4 5 triangle, was long held as sacred among occultists and underground practitioners of precursors to modern science. However, it was not until the geometric work 
of Johann Kepler, 1571-1630 A.D., that a smaller and even more fundamental triangle in this same sequence was discovered. Named after him, the Kepler triangle preserves the ratio, roughly 36 to 54, of the non-right angles that occurs in the usual 3-4-5 Pythagorean triple, however expresses these angles on a similar Pythagorean triple with shortest leg length equal to a single unit. Now, when you render a Pythagorean triple thus, with angles approximately 36, 54, 90, and the shortest leg length equal to a single unit, another Greek letter variable, symbolizing a certain irrational number sum, appears. This sum has been translated using the Greek letter phi, since at least mathematician Mark Barr, 1871 until 1950 A.D., expressed it as such after the first initial of the Greek sculptor Phidias, 480 until 430 B.C. However, from ancient times, this sum has been known of and called simply the Golden Ratio. The golden ratio is expressed for one line segment divided into two, such that the length of the shorter is relative to the length of the longer, in the same ratio as the length of the longer is to the length of both the shorter and longer legs recombined into one. In short, the golden ratio is best expressed as A plus B over A equals A over B. A basic example would be the ratio 1 to 2 thirds, but this would only be an approximation of the actual golden ratio that is expressed exactly as the irrational sum of 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, or roughly 1.618. The Kepler triangle model of a Pythagorean triple has legs equaling 1 and the square root of phi and a hypotenuse equal to phi. The squares of these legs therefore unfold as 1 squared, phi, and phi squared, a geometric progression including the golden ratio. Whether in the form of the eponymous Pythagorean triple of ratio 345 or as a product of the golden ratio in the form of the eponymous Kepler triangle of 1 to phi to square root of phi it is well documented the rising angle of the outer casing stones of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, called in Greek Cheops. In the Egyptian Giza necropolis is about 54 degrees or nearly identical to the rising angle in both the 345 Pythagorean triple and Kepler triangle. This means ostensibly the Great Pyramid at Giza is both a Pythagorean Pyramid and a Kepler Pyramid, both being merely extensions into three space of their two-dimensional counterparts, hence discussed. As an example of a Pythagorean triple and a Kepler triangle, the Great Pyramid at Giza provides humanity with a unique template for calculating these geometrical concepts as the pyramid's original designers must have as well. Consider a nearly equilateral triangle with a base length of two units, base angles of around 54 degrees, a rising hypotenuse of length phi, and a peak capstone angle of around 
72 degrees. If this 54 to 72 to 54 degree triangle is bisected vertically from the midpoint of its base to the crux of its 72 degree capstone angle, the length of this line will be, as previously posited for such a Kepler triangle, the square root of phi. So, in this model, we see the same measures as the Great Pyramid of Khufu and Giza, expressed in their smallest common denominator as a Kepler triangle. To make this 54, 72, 54 degree triangle even more accurately significant of the Khufu pyramid, we may simply attach four such triangles along their hypotenuse edges around a square base with area of four square units. This four square base unit is significant in itself and we will return to it in a later segment of this lecture. For now it is sufficient to note the height of each side of such a Kepler pyramid will be phi. When the height of the pyramid's apex above the center of its four unit square base is equal to the square root of phi. Now, in a Kepler pyramid, like a scaled-down version of the Khufu pyramid at Giza, where the rising angle off the base length is approximately 54 degrees, and where the length of this base leg is given as being one single unit, the height of the pyramid's sides is always going to be given as phi, and the height of the pyramid's apex point likewise always given as the square root of phi. This is the nature of the golden ratio as a mathematically irrational number sum. It expresses certain peculiar character traits unique to itself as well as others that it seems to share only with a few other integers, those being of the lower value counting set, such as the 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple, and its like in multiple higher factors. Although no short supply of proportions with sacred geometrical significance may be derived using the golden ratio, the earliest attempts at applying it to the method of squaring the circle involved using a Kepler triangle to define a single large square comprised in turn of four smaller squares in a standard Cartesian quadrant plane. The Kepler triangle was then plotted into this base four square as sharing its base one unit length and the right angle at the four squares axial crux. The four unit square then yields a circle by rotation that has a radius of the square root of phi. While the circumscribing circle cannot, as explained before, share an exactly identical area with the base four unit square, it does define a condition of similitude in size scale that is quantifiably negligible in its distinction of one apart from the other. Another way of looking at this may be as such. If a square-based pyramid is placed on even ground on the equator and its rising angle is around 54 degrees, then the shadow of its apex capstone will fall around and upon that base to a distance equal to the pyramid's height in a cycle throughout the year. When one considers the premise of a prehistoric Giza equator, one may begin to wonder if the Great Pyramid was not constructed as a means of squaring the circle, using its structure as a sundial and its annual shadow as a geometrical proof. Further speculations on this line of reasoning also include examining the relative sizes of our Earth and its moon by placing the circumference of Earth at the center of the larger square 
and that of the Earth's moon, such that its centroid would overlap the pinnacle of the square root of phi height triangle. These are obviously speculative studies in sacred geometry, however, and not exact science. Lost in the shifting sands of the intervening millennia are the actual details of the dispute between Hippasus the Pythagorean and his fellow Pythagorean cultists of the era during the lifetime of Pythagoras himself. The closest accounts from the era date to at least two generations following the event, with mentions of Hippasus in Plato's dialogue, Phaedo, or On the Soul, where he is listed as experimenting with musical scales derived from the Tetractus using bronze discs, and in the Metaphysics of Aristotle where Hippasus is said to have worshipped fire in Aristot.met.1.984a. .1 .1 .984a. These same authors give due credit to other mathematical discoveries, such as Plato's Theatius 147d space ff describing how Theodorus of Cyrene, circa 400 B.C., proved the irrationality of the square root of 3, the square root of 5, etc., up to the square root of 17, and such as Aristotle's prior analytics, Roman numeral 1-23, which describes an a priori proof for the irrationality of the square root of 2 that also appears at the end of Euclid's Book 10. This proof, which some scholars speculate may date back to the lifetime of Hippasus, is a proof by contradiction, or reductio ad absurdum, which shows that if the diagonal of a square is assumed to be commensurable with the side, that is, if both these lengths are in a ratio to one another, expressed as rational numbers, then the same number must be both odd and even, a number that can be seen to function as both odd and even has been ever since then, called irrational, and the most basic example of such a sum remains the square root of 2, or the diagonal of the base 1 unit square. Now, the diagonal of a basic square polygon is, as we shall soon see, an essential tool for squaring the circle that was held within the ancient's portfolio of sacred geometries. Taking a basic unit square of sides one by one, a geometer may begin to construct this earliest prototypical square circle by using a circle to quadruple this unit square's area. The radius of this circle is one base unit, and its centroid origin point overlaps one right-angled corner of each of the four quadrant basic unit squares comprising the larger area of four such basic unit squares. This circle exactly inscribes a 45-degree angle offset square formed by the four unit squares diagonals, and is itself in turn exactly inscribed within the square comprised of these four basic unit squares. What we find by performing this procedure of ancient 
sacred geometry is that a base 1 unit square has a diagonal measuring the square root of 2 and that when we quadruple this into a square with side lengths 2 by 2 and a total area of 4 such smaller base 1 unit squares the diagonals of these smaller unit squares form two circles one inscribed inside the area of 4 square and the other circumscribing around it when taken as the radius of a circle the diagonal from the area of 4 squares central origin point to any outer corner of its unit square quadrants begins to create an even larger square around the area of 4 square just as a circle inscribed within the area of 4 square would have a radius of 1 so the circle circumscribed outside the area of 4 square has a radius of the square root of 2 and just as there is a square with side lengths of 1 and so one with side lengths of 2 there is also one with side lengths of the square root of 2 and so one with side lengths of 2 square root of 2 what we find surprisingly or not in examining the ratio of the circle with radius square root of 2 relative to the square with diagonal square root of 2 is the presence again of the golden ratio signified in modern times by the Greek letter Phi the sums square root of 2 and 1 produce Phi as the ratio square root of 2 minus 1 to 1 as 1 to square root of 2 again this is a mathematically irrational trait unique to the square root of 2 and the same relationships with any other number would not hold true to fit the golden ratio. Here again, irrational phi exhibits its similarities with transcendental pi in that both these sums are inequalities. Both may be derived from the square and circle, and both are, thus, integral tools in the ancient art of squaring the circle. In discovering the irrationality of the square root of 2, Hippasus may have also inadvertently found the mathematical root for the premise of exponents, and thus accidentally ushered in the modern era for study of dimensionality as well. For example, consider a single base 1 unit square with a diagonal of square root of 2. Now this may serve as the basis for a three-dimensional cube of equal area per side to such a unit square and the diagonal across this 3D cube may be measured as the square root of 3 or this same single base 1 unit square may be doubled in area without being raised in dimension but the process expands the area the same amount in either case the volume of the three cube notwithstanding the area of a unit cube and the area of a unit square multiplied by itself are equal there is always the argument that one times one equals one or rather 1 squared equals 1 and thus the preceding statement would be meaningless however the right proper areas for these spaces may be determined using the square root of 2 measure of such a unit squares diagonal
Thus, we see in the base 1 unit square, the diagonal is square root of 2, or more exactly, 1 times the square root of 2. For the doubling of such a unit square into a square with sides of two units apiece, we find the diagonal sums square root of 8, or more exactly, 2 times the square root of 2. We find this continues on ad infinitum as the area of the square doubles, or rather grows exponentially, that the sum of its diagonal remains a function of its base and side unit lengths and square root of 2, such that the diagonal of a 2 by 2 square equals square root of 8, or 2 times the square root of 2. The diagonal of a 3 by 3 square equals square root of 18, or 3 times the square root of 2. The diagonal of a 4 by 4 square equals square root of 32, or 4 times the square root of 2, etc. This process of exponential expansion, or seen conversely, contraction, will ultimately prove to have a very useful role in the ancient process of squaring the circle. It should be ardently noted by any serious student of mathematics and geometry that the golden ratio of phi and the Fibonacci sequence and its resultant approximations of phi are not exactly identical number sums. If we were to take, say, the golden ratio being here expressed as n minus m over m equals m over n and construct from it a golden rectangle that by fractal division may be interiorly reduced down ad infinitum and likewise may expand beyond its depicted borders following the same pattern we would find this shape differs only very slightly from the same pattern formed by area squares determined by the Fibonacci sequence. But that a difference, however slight, does nonetheless exist. Therefore, even though to ancient reckoning such distinctions may not have mattered, in modern times we may realize the Fibonacci spiral and the golden ratio spiral are very, very much alike, but that they are not exactly identical. The difference between the golden ratio, phi, spiral, and what later came to be called the Fibonacci sequence, spiral, however indiscernibly minute, nevertheless fascinated ancient Pythagoreans, who included the natural shape of the nautilus shell spiral as well. Again, while none of these are a mathematically exact, identical match for any others, to the ancient mind such apparent discrepancies were trivialities besides the practical use and workability of such findings. If, indeed, they knew in antiquity that a golden ratio spiral existed separately and apart from what would ultimately be called the Fibonacci sequence spiral, it remains too difficult to ascertain at present if they applied this difference into any meaningful work. In short, it appears now that, to the ancient geometers, for all intents and purposes, the golden ratio spiral and the Fibonacci sequence spiral were one and the same thing, and, if not exactly mathematically identical, close enough to be considered the same essential premise and concept. 
Clearly, the golden ratio was known to Pythagoreans, who used the pentagram as a chief symbol for their school and later underground cults. The golden ratio occurs twice inside a pentagram. Once is the ratio of one leg of one stellation to the length of one side of the interior pentagon, and once as the ratio of these distances combined to the distance from one stellation along the interior pentagon to the next. It was highly likely these early pre-Christian Pythagoreans that began the affiliation of differing models with the pentagram's orientation, pointing one tip up and two tips down, or else two tips up and one tip down. While the early Pythagoreans likely considered the obverse or upright pentagram lucky and symbolic of even numbers and clockwise rotation, and the reverse or inverted pentagram unlucky and symbolic of odd numbers and counterclockwise rotation, it is unlikely they associated the former with the microposopus of Adam Cadman, nor the latter with the goat of Mendes, yet by then. The only angles present in the pentagram are those of the interior pentagon, each being 108 degrees, the angles of the stellation tips, each of these being 36 degrees, and the angles between the stellations and the interior pentagon, and each of these is 54 degrees. If we examine one of the pentagram's stellations by itself, we see that it contains innately angles of 36 and 54 degrees, and the golden ratio, which may be in turn expressed simply by the measures 2 for each side of the interior pentagon and 3 for each leg of each stellation. This demonstrates succinctly that a ratio of 1 to 2 thirds is also a simple and not entirely inaccurate approximation for phi that was undoubtedly known of and probably also used in the arts and architecture by the earliest human civilizations. In examining the example of phi, or the golden ratio, in the specimen of the one to two thirds proportion, the parts of these 36 and 54 degree angles in the pentagram have very important roles to play. Let us first consider the model depicted here, which shows at its base a line segment labeled AB that is divided at C between the blue line AC measuring 3 and the green line CB measuring 2. Now we simply square these sums by raising them in an exponent. The line of 2 we make one side of a square with all legs of length 2 and thus with a total area of 4. The line of 3 next to it we make a square of 3 by 3 thus with a total area of 9. Then, we simply repeat the ratio present on the baseline in each new square's sides, such that above the square of 2 by 2 equals 4 is another square of 3 by 3 equals 9, and above the lower square of 3 by 3 there is another square of 2 by 2 equals 4. So, as you can see in the diagram, the upper and lower 3 by 3 equals 9 squares overlap one another in the central 1 by 1 basic unit square. This central base 1 unit square, shown in red, may be, in turn, 
seen as occupying a space between 36 and 54 degrees from any corner, with its central diagonals of 45 degrees also aligning along those of the greater square formed of all these smaller pieces. Such a larger square formed of smaller pieces may be called a geometric gnomon, as in its sense as a plane figure formed by removing a similar parallelogram from a corner of a larger parallelogram, or, more generally, a figure that, added to a given figure, makes a larger figure of the same shape. The gnomon of the preceding base 5 or area 25 square represents only one such corner of a parallelogram and as we see here there are also larger and smaller gnomons flanking it along the diagonal as well. The first gnomon we find measures a golden ratio between 1 and the square root of 2. The second between 2 and the square root of 8, the third between 3 and the square root of 16, the fourth between 4 and the square root of 32, and the fifth between 5 and the square root of 50. In this diagram we may see also that beginning with this third iteration there is overlap with the fourth, and between the fourth and fifth there is overlap as well. As we shall see next, this pattern continues on for the known remainder of larger sums in this sequence. When we consider a base 1 unit square and render a gnomon from it by use of a semicircular arc connecting one corner to its opposite, and dividing the diagonal into a length of 1 and a length of square root of 2 minus 1. We establish the basis for what is, demonstrably, a formula applicable across this whole pattern, that being that n times the square root of 2 minus n will always equal the diagonal of the square gnomon formed in the corner of a larger parallelogram with sides equal to n. This postulate holds true for square root of 8 minus 2, square root of 18 minus 3, square root of 32 minus 4, square root of 50 minus 5, and so on. It can be demonstrated, given the space in which to do so, that this pattern extends into infinity, and that this postulate applies all across this pattern from its least to its greatest extensions. Here is a slightly more detailed gnomonic progression chart showing iterations for squares between 1 times 1 equals 1 squared and 14 by 14 equals 196 total unit squares in area. Here we may somewhat more clearly see how these gnomonic subsquares form in each corner of a parallelogram, so divided, such that for each size scale square, the smaller corner gnomon remains the same proportions and occupies the same percentage space. The smaller corner gnomons all expand between the angles of 36 and 54 along the 45 degree diagonal and they all follow the axiom for their diagonal lengths that n times the square root of 2 minus n where n equals the length of any one side. Thus, this makes the distance of the gnomonic diagonal 
easily calculable even for a square of area of 196, where it is the square root of 392 minus 14. To perform the process of squaring the circle, according to ancient reckoning, handed down to us in modern times as sacred geometry, it was necessary to have studied all these prerequisite concepts, and, as we shall see in the next section, the process of squaring the circle can be done by anyone, but will have little meaning if one does not also know and understand all these concepts as well. Thus, we shall see how we must combine the concepts of pi, phi, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, the square root of 2, as well as mnemonic expansion contraction patterns in order to square the circle. First, let us establish the toolkit we will be using to work upon the task of squaring the circle. We begin with the standard 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple, shown with its 36 degree angle marked between the leg of length 4 and the hypotenuse of length 5. From the same point on the graph, we also see a 45 degree angle labeled line that extends to a height of 4 by the time the Pythagorean triple is at its peak height of 3. While the hypotenuse extending at 36 degrees to a distance of 8 and a rise of 6 is a line segment measuring exactly 10. The 45 degree diagonal from one corner of an 8 by 8 square to the opposite measures an inequality of roughly 11 and 1 third. This demonstrates the effect of doubling or multiplying all parts by the same sum on any Pythagorean triple. In this case, we find that a triangle of side lengths 6 and 8 and a hypotenuse of length 10 is also a Pythagorean triple because it is simply the 3, 4, 5 triangle multiplied by 2. Graphically, we can see this depicted as literally two copies of a 3, 4, 5 triangle inside the area of a larger 6, 8, 10 Pythagorean triple. The addition of a 3 by 4 rectangle of 12 unit squares completes the area of this larger doubled Pythagorean triple. While the area of the Pythagorean triple whether the 3, 4, 5 or the 6, 8, 10 remains a measurement along and in this graph below the 36 degree diagonal line segment the right equilateral triangle along and again below the 45 degree diagonal line segment remains a larger area than that covered by the Pythagorean triple's expansion rate. We can also see part of the reason for the relativity between the 36 and 45 degree angles of expansion contraction is due to the arc radians of each square's width measured horizontally relative to its height measured vertically aligning along both the 36 and 45 degree angled line segments in the 3rd, 4th, 7th, and 10th iterations. As stated earlier, for any triangle with whole number sum side lengths 
it will also have a whole number sum for its area. Thus, the area of the 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple is 7 unit squares in total area, and the area of the 6, 8, 10 Pythagorean triple is 24 such base 1 unit squares. Just so, for the 8 by 8 equilateral 45 degree triangle, the total area is made of 26 such unit squares. Within the geometric context, some of these unit squares inside the areas of these triangles are incomplete, though once all added together, they necessarily sum whole number sums. Thus, this is the primary tool we will work with while squaring the circle. So we see in this depiction the by now already familiar 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple nested as a 36 degree angle triangle inside a 45 degree angle triangle that in turn extends from the midpoint to the corner of three squares each with the same center but each with different areas. The central square is a 6 by 6 equals 36 area square. The outer square an 8 by 8 equals 64 area square. And between them in red ink is the square of 7 by 7 equals 49. Now, given the formula for the area of a circle being a equals pi r squared, where a is area, r squared is radius squared, and pi is roughly 3.14, we find that the area of a circle, also shown in red, with a radius 4 and an overlapping centroid is equal to exactly 50.27, a relatively close approximation of the area of the square of that circle, the 7 by 7 equals 49 square. Stepping up to the next iteration of expansion, we see the same familiar 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple measuring the 36 degree angle below and within the equilateral 45 degree triangle. Here we can see the 3, 4, 5 triangle rests entirely inside of one-fourth of an 8 by 8 equals 64 square that is inscribed by a circle with radius 6, which in turn is circumscribed by a 12 by 12 equals 144 total area square. Between these, and estimating the area of the radius 6 circle, is the 10 by 10 equals 100 square. The area of this circle is exactly pi times 6 squared, or 113. So, what began as a margin of error, or difference of 1.27 unit square areas, at the iteration of a circle with radius equals 5, already by the time the radius has increased to 6, this difference or margin of error has increased concordantly to some 13. While 13 may be at least a whole number, it does represent a significant margin of difference. Here we see the sacred geometry depiction of the ancient's circle-squared graph. 
we find in its midst the 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple with its area of 26 base 1 unit squares within the square of 8 by 8 equals 64 and at the furthest depicted extent of this expansion the 6, 8, 10 Pythagorean triple with an area of 24 base 1 unit squares. Here we may see that the 7 by 7 equals 49 square approximates the circle of 50.27 between the squares of 6 by 6 equals 36 and 8 by 8 equal 64 that the 10 by 10 equals 100 square likewise approximates the circle of 113 between the 8 by 8 equals 64 and the 12 by 12 equals 144 squares and that the 14 by 14 equals 196 square approximates the pi 8 squared equals 201.06 real area of the circle between the 13 by 13 equals 169 and 15 by 15 equals 256 squares. This final iteration yields an offset or margin of error of 5.06 indicating the margin of error is not a continuously expanding gap within the infinitely expanding sequence but that this differential fluctuates in range instead. Further study of how and why this variable alternates from lesser to greater number sums may indicate deeper insights into this sacred geometric process in ever larger size scales. All method of thinking along these lines is called, rightly, squaring the circle. So, hopefully, what we have learned by now is that the process of squaring the circle, although mathematically impossible to accomplish exactly, due to the transcendental nature of pi, was a matter of commonplace estimation and approximations in the ancient world, and that, due to certain otherwise only irrational traits of very small number sums, in most cases, these approximations were not at all inaccurate, such as in the case of the 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple. Therefore, by combining the 45 degree diagonal expansion contraction rate of the square root of 2 with the 36 degree diagonal expansion contraction rate of phi, the golden ratio, we begin to understand how to square the circle as the ancients meant. Furthermore, it is equally not impossible that these ancients had calculated far more detailed estimations and approximations than we now know of simply from studying their remnant fragments of scrolls and rare extant artifacts of clay. Again, the fact that Giza necropolis was ever erected at all, let alone with its renowned precision of accuracy, is testimony of the ancients' knowledge of much higher maths than we now realize. These same ancients should also be credited with the invention or discovery of these basic mathematical laws and, although we may call them by the names of their modern reinventors or rediscoverers, the ancients were likely no less aware of these concepts, if only by different titles. For example, 
phi, that irrational factor of the Fibonacci sequence, being called from time immemorial the golden ratio. At its most basic core, the ancient concept of squaring the circle simply involves examining the formula for the area of a circle, a equals pi r squared, and comparing its results to the nearest whole number squared area. Although an exact correlation is mathematically impossible, as we know now, the founders of our modern maths applied a process to this problem involving estimation and approximation, beginning with how they quantified the circle using pi, a circle with radius one-half, and thus diameter of base one, will have a circumference of two pi radians. This was the initial establishment of the mathematical language from ancient times. It followed from this, in their reasoning, that a similar arrangement would exist in larger size, scale, circles, and squares, whereby, for a circle with radius 1, a square with equal area would exist, each of whose sides measures the square root of pi. Hence was borne out the series of estimations and approximations, constituting the process of squaring the circle for iterations above the base one unit square. Thus, a square with sides of the square root of pi having the same area as a circle with a radius equaling one began being expanded to the iteration of the one by one equals one squared square then to the 2 by 2 equals 4 square, then the 3 by 3 equals 9 square, and so on and so forth, as I have now demonstrated, literally ad infinitum. This completes this knowledge lecture on the ancient sacred geometrical process of squaring the circle. Take note that this simple geometry is lost on those who never learn of it and wasted on those who learn of it but who do not study it on their own. While this knowledge may have been commonplace 2,500 years ago, it is most certainly lost knowledge for the vast majority of modern people, even we who are living in a post-internet age. Therefore, I would encourage you to study and share this information. There remains an interesting footnote involving the inscription of a Kepler triangle into a circle. First one constructs a Kepler triangle with leg lengths 1 and the square root of phi and hypotenuse length phi. Then one extends it into a square with each side length square root of phi. Lastly, one circumscribes the Kepler triangle in an enclosing circumference. Once one has done this, a diagram like the one depicted emerges in which the perimeters of the square four times the square root of phi and the circle pi times phi coincide up to an error less than 0 0.1 percent. This manner of very nearly mathematically squaring the circle is only inaccurate to the degree that pi approximates 4 over the square root of phi, however, can never be exactly equal to 4 over the square root of phi, because pi is a transcendental number sum. Though there is much ado over the transcendental nature of pi, the term merely means that 
all infinite continued fractions with bounded terms that are not eventually periodic are transcendental, while eventually periodic continued fractions correspond to quadratic irrationals. Therefore, pi has been proven transcendental because its continued fractioning, its post-decimal place integer sequence, can provably go on into a literally uncountably infinite number sum set, whereas the golden ratio, called now phi, is still considered to be merely irrational because, although one has not yet been found, it is expected that the post-decimal continued fractioning of phi has a definite end. Thus, all transcendentals are irrational, but not all irrationals are transcendental. Again, the golden ratio, or phi, is not considered transcendental because it is a root of the polynomial equation x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0. Likewise, the square root of 2 is considered irrational, but not transcendental, as it is a root of the polynomial equation, x squared minus 2 equals 0. Again, phi and the square root of 2 may be irrational and continue on seemingly unendingly in their post-decimal fractioning. However, in reality, both of these fractions do come to an end. Pi does not, and nor does Euler's number, called E, which we will discuss further in a moment. As an altogether aside, a particular piece of art, likely from the 17 or 1800s AD, depicts a bearded man bedecked in fine robes and a rich hat, opening a large compass to inscribe a circle around twin naked graffiti presumably symbolizing Adam and Eve, on a wall of crumbling plaster that resembles a map of northern Europe and the islands of Great Britain and Ireland. At his feet are an astrolabe, a drafting square, and a manuscript of other diagrams, including a pentagram and a hexagram. The arrangement of geometric elements in this depiction of the inscribed circle on the wall are of particular noteworthiness, while the large triangle circumscribed by the compass's circle appears to be symbolic of the golden ratio, or phi, the lower half of it, wherein are shown the nude graffito man and woman, contains the characters in a circle bound inside a square. Symbolically, the depiction appears to indicate an upward-oriented direction meant to be taken by the twin graffiti. In terms of actual sacred geometry, it seems to have merely been influenced by Kepler's triangles, but not be a copy after one. To find the E, phi, pi triangle. We begin with the base 1 unit square as a quadrant and a base 2 total area 4 square. As we close in on the base 1 unit square, we should examine its square root of 2 diagonal and how this same line segment may form the radius of a circle that then inscribes the whole four square. Again, note that the ratio of the line segment square root of two minus one to the line segment one is proportionate to the ratio of the line segment one to the line segment 
square root of 2. This ratio approximates, but is not exactly equal to, phi. Next, let's zoom in still further to the relationship of the square root of 2 diagonal acting as a radius and the square root of 5 diagonal spanning across the 1 to 2 golden rectangle from 1 to the opposite corner. Here we see the base 1 unit square the 1 to 2 golden ratio rectangle, the square root of 5 diagonal of such a rectangle, and the square root of 2 diagonal of a unit square used as a radius for a circle. As we are about to see, the square root of 2, the square root of 3, and the square root of 5 are basic measurements in a vesica Pisces arrangement. The vesica Pisces, or fish vessel, in addition to being the geometric origin for the symbolic ichthys, or fish logo, used by early Christians some 2,000 years ago, is a storehouse of several anciently understood sacred geometric ratios. When two equal-sized circles are conjoined to overlap one another exactly one-half each, such that the midpoint of one circle is a point on the circumference of the other, then the standard Vesica Pisces graphic depiction is formed. There are variants wherein the twin circles overlap either more or less than halfway, but these are irrelevant to a discussion of the measures that occur in the particular Vesica Pisces wherein the twin circles overlap only and exactly halfway. What we find when we construct such a halfway overlapped twin circle Vesica Pisces motif is that when the radius of these circles are given as base 1 such that each is a standard unit circle, then we find the square root of 2 also as a diagonal of the twin squares drawn to cover the overlapping circles area, the square root of 5 as a diagonal connecting one corner of these twin squares to the opposite corner, and lastly, the square root of 3 as the vertical line segment connecting one archway of the vesica to the opposite. Now, when the same motif is depicted again in sequential ratios to those of the 1 to 2 rectangular covering space, only nonetheless at a slightly different size scale, we may measure a particularly miraculous triangle from within this shape as well. When the diameter of each of the twin halfway overlapped circles in the vesica model is taken as equaling the transcendental number sum pi, then diagonals connecting the ends of either circle's diameter to the point at the apex of the archway of their shared space will measure phi for the shorter leg and e for the longer. Now, this triangle is indisputable, obvious, and elegant, yet remains mysterious in many ways. That a triangle with leg lengths equal to phi and e and a hypotenuse length equal to pi exists is not necessarily itself surprising, considering that even though each of these may be an irrational number and two of them transcendental numbers, meaning they cannot be derived evenly from any algebraic equation, they can still be represented as continuously fractional integer sums and thus treated as numerical variables in ordinary polynomial equations. In short, 
pi equals approximately 3.14, phi equals approximately 1.618, and E equals approximately 2.71828. Thus, relating these sums to one another trigonometrically is not impossible and it even occurs naturally in the context of the vesica Pisces motif. The E Phi Pi triangle is another unique extraction from the sacred geometrical vesica Pisces. Although it is very closely proximal to being a right triangle, the E Phi Pi triangle is not a proper right triangle because its closest proximal corner is 89.1 degrees and not 90 degrees as in a proper right triangle. The corner between the shorter phi leg and the longer e leg is 89.1 degrees. The angle between the shorter phi leg and the pi hypotenuse is 59.9 degrees exactly and that between the longer E leg and the pi hypotenuse is exactly 31 degrees. These exact measurements also place the E phi pi triangle as being more like a 1 2 square root of 3 right triangle with interior angles of 30, 60, 90 degrees rather than the traditional 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triple which notably has interior angles of approximately 36, 54, 90 degrees.